Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Spring Live series. Thank you for joining us today. I am Paulo Souza Jr., course lead for SC3X Supply Chain Dynamics, which is part of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program from MIT. I am happy to be co-hosting this live event today with my colleague Miguel Rodriguez Garcia, course lead for SC1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. Hello, Miguel. Hi, Paulo. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you and with our uh, guest speaker and excited to bring the, the industry perspective to our MicroMasters, which is what we do in these live events. So today we will talk about inventory management. And to do that, we are going to follow the same agenda as we did in the first live event. So first, our guest speaker will give us a presentation that will last around 25 minutes. And after that, we'll have some time at the end to answer some questions from you guys, from everyone in the audience. So that will last probably around 15 minutes. And we encourage you to use uh, the Q&A feature in Zoom. Please try to avoid the chat because it's really hard for us to follow uh, the questions. So you have the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, for that. And Paul and I will be channeling all those questions at the end to our guest speaker. And just before um, going back to Paolo and, and to our guest speaker, I just want to mention that this event is part of the MITx MicroMasters Program in Supply Chain Management, a program that we developed here at the Center for Transportation and Logistics in MIT, and as well as Supply Chain Fundamentals and Supply Chain Dynamics, which are uh, both courses hosting this event. The MicroMasters Program includes other courses, a total of five, and some of them are currently open right now. So don't hesitate to check them out. We'll be posting the link uh, for, the, for our program in the chat in case you guys are interested in any of the other courses that we have. So now back to you, Paolo, so you can introduce our guest speaker. Thank you so much, Miguel. So today we are honored to have Rafaela Nunes joining us. Rafaela is the Technology Innovation and Data Strategy Director at CMA CGM. Before joining the company, she worked for more than 10 years in different supply chain roles in consumer goods and as a consultant supporting customers in deploying digital solutions. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in naval engineering from the University of Sao Paulo and a master's degree in supply chain management from MIT. By the way, um, Rafaela was part of the first MIT supply chain management blended cohort. Before being admitted to the blended cohort, she successfully completed all courses from the MicroMasters program. And as um, some of you may already know, one among many other benefits from earning the MicroMasters program credential is that you become eligible to apply to the supply chain management blended master's program at MIT and also to other universities around the world. Um, all right, so welcome, Rafaela. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Paulo, and thank you, Miguel, as well. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. It's um, super excited to be here with like the this big cohort. I've seen a lot of people ch chatting from different parts of the world. I think this is really like the energy that we had in the Marker Masters and uh, also at MIT. So again, excited to be here and be able to share a little bit of knowledge with the group. Let me get started. Uh, share my, my screen with you guys. Bear with me. And Paulo and Miguel, you let me know if everybody can see it well. Yeah. Yes, I can see your screen. Yeah, it works perfect. Awesome. Yeah, thanks again for the introduction, Paulo. Just again, a little bit about myself and just some uh, some things to to time myself or aid myself. I don't know what is the what is the word. As Paulo mentioned, I was uh, part of the first cohort in the supply chain masters blended program. So I completed my MicroMasters in 2017 and I applied for the blended program at MIT. A little bit of my background, uh, again, as Paulo mentioned, um, I had a career in supply chain for consumer goods and for retail, worked as independent consultant. I'm originally from Brazil, came, for, came to the US for the MicroMasters and then for the masters actually. And then, um, I've been in CMA CGM, um, a container shipping company leading technology and innovation uh, since four years ago. I'm based in the US. And uh, the case I'm going to present is back from my consultant times. Um, and again, excited to, to share the knowledge with you guys. 
So moving to the title. So uh, I'm sharing about inventory management and how to align the company strategies with the right policies. Again, this is just a case that, um, that I worked when I was a consultant back in Brazil. Um, I think before we get started, I would love to know a little bit about uh, you guys and your company supply chain. Um, and Lisa, if you can launch the poll, I would love to know what is your company's supply chain strategy? So I have three options here. Is your company following the lowest cost possible for a given service level or the highest service possible for a given cost? What is restricting your company's strategy? And you can, of course, be not sure. Um, I think sometimes it's a little bit hard uh, to navigate big corporations and like the changes in strategies. So I would love to hear from you guys. And uh, Paulo and Lisa, let me know once it's uh, yeah. I'm not very familiar with like the timing for polling. Let me know when it's a good time for us to close. Yeah, they are still voting. Okay. So by now we have almost an 150. So I think we're good to go, Lisa. And here are the results. Can you see the results? Yes, I can see the results. Uh, yeah, it seems so. It seems like the majority of the folks, it's almost a tie, but the majority of the folks have the highest service possible for a given cost. It seems like cost is really restricting uh, supply chain from companies. I think this is uh, uh, interesting, but a, a, lot of, a, a lot of you guys are also saying that you have like the lowest cost possible, but it's a, it's a service driven supply chain, which is pretty interesting. And um, again, for those that are not sure, I do encourage you guys after this presentation and throughout this day or week to think about that. And then in case you're not sure, try to find out what is really driven your, driving your company's supply chain for you to be aligned with your inventory policies, with your distribution policies or any, any planning that you, you might do in the future. Thanks for the poll, guys, and thanks for, for the engagement. Let's get started. So just to give you a little bit of context. So again, I was a consultant leading the supply chain practice in a boutique consulting uh, company. And we had this customer that was a cash and carry wholesale. They have around 30 stores in low income and very sensitive to price. Uh, areas, uh, around 10,000 SQs and two major distribution centers in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, which is a big city. Um, just to give a little bit of context, I know there are folks from different uh, countries, different geographies here. Um, I'm not sure if all the geographies will have like similar, similar chains, but uh, we're talking about like a place where people go to either buy in book or get big discounted items for their small business. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see like folks that own a restaurant to go to the chain and also like families that were uh, seeking to save money, right? So for those that thought about the supply chain strategy and the eventually the inventory strategy of your company, um, think about a chain like that that is very, very driven for price, where their customers are very, very driven for price, what should be the strategy, right? So let's move on. Um, a little bit about like the problem here. So the scope was we were helping the replenishment team that was pulling, that was at placing the orders for the distribution centers to add inventory in the stores, right? And the recommendations could also serve the procurement team in that chain to place the order for the suppliers. And those suppliers, those vendors, they would deliver products in the distribution centers that would then deliver to stores. 
and those suppliers could also like deliver straight to stores. So there are two major teams that could uh, influence the inventory. So we started by uh, one small scope here, but also influencing what the other team would do. So what we are trying to solve for this customer. Um, they had a very high stock out perception for discounted items. So for those that are familiar with Verteo chains, if you go to the store and then you don't have a product, you have like your empty shelves, um, customer is not happy and like the store managers are not happy. Um, some of the key items in the shelves were not there, right? So there's, and when I say perception is because they didn't have a KPI for that, which is again, it might be common uh, in some places. Some places are, of course, is way more mature and there are plenty of KPIs to monitor stock house, right? But just something to think about. The other thing is that was a very low adherence in the replenishment solution. So there was an ERP that we, the, this replenishment team here could actually um, place the orders, but they were not necessarily like following it because a lot of times they didn't have the right products to actually send to the stores, right? Because this team here eventually didn't have this procured. And there was no fixed pro procurement portfolio. Something, this is extremely important. This team here, like the procurement team, they were extremely opportunistic and they would buy items according to the price. So if they would see uh, an opportunity, they would go there and buy like in bulk that specific item for that specific week or month. And for the customers, as I say, the customers were very, very sensitive to price, right? The customers that would visit the store, they wouldn't necessarily be very loyal to brands. That was not the point. If you would be loyal to brands, you'd go to another chain. It was all about pricing. So what we did, and that's what I'm gonna go through uh, in the presentation, we worked on a solution that was like segmenting this, the portfolio in kind of main two different items, right? And we did different strategies for forecasting and replacement management for those two different like category of items, right? That's kind of what the solution was about. The way we did it, um, it was through data analytics and analytics of stakeholders, the, the way I'm calling here, really like going and understanding what are the what were the dynamic of those teams here? How did they work? What was the thing that was important? What what was the things that were important for the store managers here, right? When I say analytics here uh, of stakeholders, I know it's not necessarily something usual, but just something to, to have in mind. And then, um, we also um, worked on different, again, different modeling for forecast and replenishment for those two different categories. And in that case, we'll deliver something simple, uh, an MVP tool that the company uh, could use and pilot the strategies that we were proposing, right? So it was important to actually like connect them to end with some action things that they could actually like implement. So, let me just walk you through uh, how it worked, right? This, this whole thing. So a few insights that we had when we were like in this problem discovering, talking to people, but also like going deeper into the data that we had. So we, when we went through this data, we got a few insights, right? So we analyzed the seasonality daily seasonality, weekly seasonality. Uh, we did some visual analysis. We did some indexing testings. Um, sometimes we needed to adjust certain things to the stockouts because there were a lot of stockouts in some items. Uh, we really understood the procurement strategy that was not necessarily something documented, but again, interviewing stakeholders. And um, for, we also did some testings in running some regressions for the discounted items. What would be the increase in sales for those discounted items, right? I think some insights that were relevant for this analysis were, um, first, we decided to split the SQ segmentation in two different categories. And that was really like key um, for, for this. 
we split those items in what we call replaceable and non-replaceable. So this first assumption that there was no brand loyalty at all was a little bit uh, misleading. There were some brands and some key items um, that customers would really go to that place and look for is specifically if they were discounted, right? So there are just a few, but let's say a milk for that specific brand was really in, customer would go there for that. A tomato sauce for some specific brand, customers would go there for that. Everything else could be replaceable, like the, the, the brands that were not necessarily like with high loyalty, it would be more price driven. And um, those non-replaceable items, again, higher brand loyalty and sensitivity to promotions. And specifically, if they were discounted, people would go to the stores for that. Another thing that we found about like the weekends, the, the seasonality is that the weekdays would be like relatively the same, but in the weekends, we had like a very high seasonality, right? So people would really like go there or buy in the weekend. Yeah, and just a few insights when we kind of start digging into a problem and what are the things that uh, help us with that. So what we decided to do in terms of like modeling for this scenario after understanding this, um, the complexity. So the first thing is the forecasting, right? We do not start a, replenish a replenishment strategy without a forecasting. So um, we, we split our items in those two categories. So for the non-replaceable items, those that couldn't necessarily uh, be missing in the store and they were very sensitive to price. We had uh, weekly forecasting by SQ in store. So very specific. It did include the promotion effect, the increasing factor. What the, from, from those regression analysis, what would change for this demand, for the, the demand of this product if I discounted the next amount of uh, like currency, local currency. So for the replacement, the, the replaceable items, this was really like key. Traditionally companies do forecasting and replacement and replenishment like SQ by SQ, but we decided to go by family specifically because there was no brand loyalty, right? And there was no promotion in those items. So there was no, no need to worry about that. So instead of forecasting a rise for that specific brand, that specific size or that specific SQ, we would do for the whole category, right? And we needed to, um, to standardize some units. Um, but this whole idea, uh, gave us something that was extremely important, which is less variability in the demand. And if you guys are following the course as well, uh, if you have less variability in the demand, you'd need less safe to stock. Again, that was key because we could lower the safe to stock for the same service level, therefore lowering the cost with less demand variability. So again, we are forecasting those, all those replacement items just by the category. And again, advantage is here, less complexity. Instead of having to forecast like a thousand items, we would forecast like 200 items. And the lower variability, again, the pooling effect, if I'm, if I'm forecasting for everything separately versus like the whole thing, one, one variability of the night and that kind of annihilates the other one. Uh, so something important here. Um, in terms of the replenishment strategy for those two different categories, one would be really like weekly by SQ, a uh, very high level tar target service level and alerts for stockouts because those guys, th those products couldn't be missing. Uh, for the replenish, the replaceable items, uh, we would have um, a weekly, but by family. And I would just need to have in a particular store, one or two SQs from that specific family, right? And um, the leverage stock and variety across these st stores, right? We could um, have kind of the same, I didn't necessarily need to have the same SQ 
in, in the same store, right? And in terms of stock visibility, uh, I did have like, again, a much higher control. And again, why it was important, you remember when uh, we talked about what was really important for those stakeholders, there was a very high perception of like products missing, but the key products missing, not all the products missing, right? So this one, we really needed to kind of analyze a little bit closer, right? And um, we would give, therefore, a focus in the non-replaceable items. And we will avoid what we're calling fake stockouts, which is like a, a product that is missing in the plan. But the reality is for the consumer, it doesn't quite matter because they could replace for other items. So we would focus on something that is really like non-replaceable and that the customers would go there for buying that specific brand. In terms of like uh, the way we implemented this, um, we specifically did a pilot with a, a tool. And again, it was a simple Excel-based tool like connected to an SQL server and giving some simple analytics in that specifically on the non-replaceable items. So we did, um, pilot with one category in, in dry goods. Um, and we have like the new segmentation visibility. Non-replaceable items would be on the SQ level and the replacement items would be in the category level, right? So the stock out would be a stock out alert for the SQ in certain items and for the family in other items. Uh, high stock levels, the same, right? I would not, I, the point was not being one SQ by SQ for items that were easily replaceable by the consumers. In terms of uh, what it brought us, um, results for this pilot, right? And again, I'm presenting here, um, a work that we've done like for six months that uh, gave this customer this a small tool for one specific category of products in their in their store. I think the main point here and back to our pool at the beginning is that we had the inventory policies aligned with, aligned with the company strategy. So again, what was the company strategy? to really, really lower the cost of the products because they wanted to serve that consumer that was very price oriented, but to have that specific products that the customers would go there looking for when, especially when they were discounted, available for the customers at that specific store, right? So um, in terms of results, um, it of course, promoted a higher ser service level on the discounted items that would be looked a little bit differently uh, and a better visibility about the, the real problem, which was like the non-replaceable items stock out. So the company had like some flyers of discounts and if that specific item was in discount in that specific week with like this higher brand loyalty, that is really like what the problem of stock, stock out was. Um, and then again, the inventory and cost reduction here. Um, I needed a lower safety stock level if I have less variability. Again, that pool effect that we started to forecast those products by category. Um, and there was something here that enabled the teams to follow their current strategy because the procurement of that company that was like, placing the orders for the vendors, they were being very opportunistic. Sometimes they didn't necessarily need to buy that SQ for that specific brand. Let's say for milk, if you have like some vendors that could provide something for the lowest cost, if there was in that category that the customers are not very loyal to the brand, um, you could just go there and buy. And then if the price was not um, it was not good in that specific month or week of cycle, you wouldn't buy them. And that was okay because you would have like other items that could replace. So it enables the procurement to 
they were already executing this, but really like it was a, an overall strategy of inventory management that enables the procurement to execute the opportunistic approach in negotiating with vendors saying, okay, um, this is, this is what I can pay and then getting like this lowest price. Um, and again, aligned with everybody else instead of having the replenishment team thinking they should like send the inventory for all the items for the stores based on their previous ERP system or recommendation. But now they could do this only in some specific SKUs or like the, for, for the brand. Um, and again, the policies align with the chain's strategy, right? It was a low cost chain for sure, and low brand loyalty for most of the products, right? So again, back to our, our question in the beginning, um, I do encourage you guys to think about what is your company supply chain strategies. And then how can you align not only the inventory um, planning here, but even like the day-to-day -day interactions and like any decisions that you do in your supply chain to have that in mind. I think it will help a lot in the day-to-day -day decisions and what are the items that needs to be on shelf? What are the items that eventually it is okay? And what is really like important for the customer, for the brand and for, for the consumer? So I hope you enjoy uh, and it was a little bit uh, insightful for you to connect the course material with um, a real case example. Excited to get some questions. Thank you, Rafaela. Yeah, no, for sure. At, at least as you want learners, I'm pretty sure that they are connecting the dots right away because uh, the content is great. And they right now we are uh, like in right in the middle of the course. So they are going to start getting more and more uh, into inventory management. So I think this overview uh, of that connection between demand forecasting and inventory management was was really, really great. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to start, um, uh, Paolo, if that's okay uh, with you with some of the questions. Um, so first, this one is actually mine because uh, I'm really interested in the in the demand forecasting topic and and then uh, I'm going to uh, go right into the learner's questions. But I I'm curious, how did you segment the SKU between replaceables and non-replaceables in terms of like, you know, the KPIs that you use? Like, how did you create that split? Because I think that's a, a big deal for supermarkets, uh, like in terms of like how to decide, oh, this is a replaceable item and this is not. You know, what kind of information data uh, did you guys use during the project uh, to make that split? Yeah, that's that that's a great question, Miguel. Um, it, it, it's interesting when I say like the analytics of the stakeholders, right? So I think it is a combination between uh, we going through all the items that were promoted or discounted in the past mm -hmm. uh, in the past months, but then presenting it to the stakeholders and specifically the procurement team, and then kind of suggesting some items and aligning this portfolio with them. So it was a combination of us like looking through the data, but also working with the teams to see, to validate what, what we saw in terms of strategies and taking that human expertise. So we had like folks there in procurement that were doing this for like 20 years and really understanding what was uh, the, the customer's uh, preference and what worked and what not and selecting that portfolio that they needed to, to, to discount. So uh, I would say it was a combination of us like looking through the data and seeing, okay, this seems to be very sensitive to pricing and is much more sensitive than the other ones in the category. Um, versus, plus uh, talking to the procurement team and they then in the stores team and then confirming, yeah, 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 this one we cannot not have because customers come here looking for it. Really interesting because so price sensitivity was one of the key KPIs. Uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. really, really okay. Paulo, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you so much, Rafael, for a great presentation, sharing your insights. And it's interesting because SC3X learners, they are probably preparing for their midterm exam and they may recall the importance of aligning 
the supply chain strategy to the company's strategy. So great insights there. Thank you so much. And let me read a question from Parishak. Um, it's related to non-replaceable products. So uh, this learner mentions that forecasting at SQ store level, um, the data is very sparse generally. How much forecast accuracy at SQ level was achieved? And if you can share which two and which forecasting model uh, was used for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's a great question. So again, this was a uh, this was a small pilot that we've done uh, in um, that category of like two uh, a thousand of SQs. So um, the the strategy to just go, go for these specific items in the store level uh, enable us. And those are very like high uh, high volume items, right? So for those, we didn't have like as much sparse as if you would go to other items. I think the biggest challenge in terms of like data was to adjust for the stockouts. Um, so to be honest, I I don't remember for sure, but I I I I, I know we we did some adjustments in the stockout based on the the. So we would compare the level of stocks versus the demand. And if there was a stock out, we would do some adjustments. Uh, that was uh, done again in a sample. And then uh, we was too wise for that pilot with Excel plus then replicating in the database for like a large amount of items. Um, and then to forecast those items, uh, we had a simple forecasting model um, that, again, it's, it's it's a case, it's been a while. Um, I, I think we started by having like some really simple moving average, but the key there would be a regression to adapt that volume to the discount that was applied. So um, maybe you guys can follow me, yeah, you can help out, but there was like a, a model that would consider the past, seasonalities of the weekend, and the discount factor. Maybe some, um, I'll find a name and I'll- So, I'll no, I mean, yeah. whole winters for sure can, uh, I mean, take into account seasonality. If, if you consider all the variables like the discounted price and all that, probably you need some kind of like more advanced uh, model, I guess. But but the basics for seasonality trend all that I think that the learners have seen them in uh, with whole winters yeah but mm -hmm. interesting okay thank you thank you so much for the for the answer Rafaela so we have a lot of questions uh, I can tell the audience now that we are not going to be able to answer them all <laughs> so because people really enjoyed the presentation so I'm gonna go straight into another question from uh, Noel Lam. So uh, this learner is actually asking us um, something really interesting related to the consolidation of SKUs. So the question is, if uh, a re an item is considered replaceable and, and you actually forecast and replenish by family, does that lead also to a consolidation in the procurement side? Because at the end of the day, um, the, the idea is, OK, now would you have kind of like SKUs that are exchangeable somehow. So did that also uh, end up being a consolidation, for example, of suppliers in terms of like reducing the number of suppliers to gain economies of scale? Like how that uh, affected the, the procurement side? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I think it, uh, the recommendation for procurement would be you have to buy X amount of items for that category. Okay. Do your best. <laughs> and what was happening already was they were doing their best in buying only those where the price was, um, it was an opportunistic strategy. So they would have like uh, meetings with vendors and suppliers all the time, but saying, if you don't achieve that specific price, I wouldn't buy for you. So it enabled them to say, to really execute the strategy that was already done, but aligned with the other policies, right? So we would say, uh, you need to buy, let's say, X amount of units of that specific category and have at least two brands, um, two different types of SQs to, 
have a little bit of variety, right? So depending on like what they would find in terms of like lowest cost and more opportunistic procurement or better conditions of procurement, then they they, they would buy it. So it, it, def it seems like it definitely brought a lot of negotiation power to the procurement team. Like it, uh, it did, indeed, it. yeah, yeah, and and again, I think it it brought the negotiation power and enabled them to already use what they because that that was the way they operated anyways, right? Yeah. But the stores and the other side were not necessarily aligned, and they would looking for some items that were not in the procurement strategy anyways because that was not, and the procurement team was really like the core of the company's strategy in terms of like really getting the lowest cost and enable the company to like grow. Interesting, interesting. Thank you. Paolo, do you wanna go? Yeah, we have one more question here. So Steve is asking how to find out whether customers are loyal to a specific brand. How did you follow this approach um, in this case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Some of the analysis that we've done and that was more like, Again, there was a data analysis and then the stakeholder interviews and all that. But some of the analysis we've done that if one product was missing, that whole category would be down in those non-replaceable. For some products, if they were missing, life would go on, right? So in, in that specific category. So I think the, the point of like, you would see the, the movement of that whole category and see, okay, what was the, the SQs missing? Uh, some of them, they would really like lower the, 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 the demand of the whole category. Some of them, as long as we had some stocks from others, it, it would be okay. So with that list and then the validation of like the stores and all the folks, they would say, yeah, yeah, this is really uh, something that uh, makes sense, right? So it's kind of a data analytics plus a, a cross validation. Thank you so much. We still have many, many questions here. Uh, maybe we can take one more, Miguel. You want to take the next one? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, and we have we have time. Uh, maybe like a couple more, like one me and one you until uh, nine forty-five. Okay. Yeah, because uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions. So I think we we should give the the audience like as many chances as we can to to ask Rafael as some great questions. So. Michael Wagner uh, is asking something really specific, but I think really interesting in terms of like SKU forecasting uh, and uh, segmentation. So how did you deal with different units, uh, packages, sizes when you decide, like when you did the whole project, like in terms of forecasting and those exchangeable items? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. So we standardize all the units. So let's say if I was dealing with rice, I would do everything in uh, in grams or kilograms versus the um, unit itself, right? So, and again, a recommendation for the procurement would be like, you have to have X amount of kilos of that specific uh, item, right? And you could even, for instance, if you're dealing with a vendor and they have like a lot of like inventory, uh, Labs for one specific size, that could be something that could be used opportunistically. And But one thing to point out is that that chain didn't have a lot of variety in terms of like sizes. And so I, again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for everything, <laughs> uh, but in that specific uh, context, what the customers would be like, you know, small business, they will look for bulk items. They were, it was a little bit of already standardized. You didn't see like, and different ways of selling the same product, right? It was really like already very standard pack packaging. The sizes would vary, but it wouldn't be like you can buy something very small and you can buy like tons of something. So yeah, um, no, it, it makes total sense. I mean, as you mentioned throughout the whole presentation, this strategy aligns uh, like the, the inventory management strategy has to align with the business strategy. Uh, and it wouldn't work for a, probably a discount store that sells like really, really small. Um, personalized uh, like sizes or packages. So yeah, no, thank you, thank you. Really. So Paulo, do you wanna take the the last one, maybe? Yeah, let me take one more. And this one is from Atiab. So how do technological advancements such as AI, machine learning, and blockchain uh, impact inventory management? And how can companies leverage these technologies to optimize their inventory levels and increase efficiency? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, again, the, the, there was a, this was a case um, that we, I mean, we use very sophisticated uh, 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 techniques, I, I would say, but not necessarily uh, the use of AI and machine learning. The way I've seen, I'm going to answer with like my past experience, like looking through the trends in the market and companies that are emerging and so on. So what I, I've seen in, in that sense is a lot of emerging solutions in what people are calling enterprise AI. Um, and specifically for inventory management is instead of going for a deterministic approach, as I say, um, you know, we have like a forecast, even if you consolidate this, but it's very deterministic, right? You have a forecast and then you go, you have a, a strategy for replenishment, you have like weekly orders and so on. Um, today, there are models. And again, there are companies bringing solutions in that space where you really take into consideration like tons, tons, tons of data. So uh, you have like how many customers were in that store at a specific time, uh, the where the where the product was positioned in, in the shelf, and then what happened in the procurement, like if we, if you can track um, some behaviors that were on in the procurement side as well, and you kind of take this all into consideration, and you can maybe use AI to optimize for service, to optimize for profitability, to to look for. Um, what is the best model that you can actually go and like to simplify the recommendations, right? What it happens though, is that the models are not necessarily super easy explainable. <laughs> so, um, but then what I've seen working is really like companies that could measure the results satisfactory, right? So are you using AI to, uh, go for the highest profitability, then you follow up your profitability or to go for the highest service level and then you follow up and you see if that model is actually helping you versus what you have in terms of deterministic approach. So it's just kind of a different way of like you interpreting the models and the results. It's not necessarily super interpretable uh, for planners in general. It's a, I would say it's a big change management, but like, especially for like newcomers, I think that is a uh, a lot of advantages in using like more sophisticated tools like that. Um, again, I've seen in this enterprise AI market, a lot of emerging companies uh, doing that. That is again, not a deterministic approach as I described, but really like taking into consideration tons of factors and forecasting, optimizing for, and planning for, for certain uh, key KPIs. That's great insights. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing this final like uh, overview of what uh, I don't know the future could look like for inventory management, uh, considering like, all the new technologies that are that are coming. So I think with this, uh, we it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, I mean, we could spend here the whole day probably because we still have many questions from our learners, uh, but we want to be respectful with everyone's time. Uh, so thank you so much, Rafaela. Thank you so much to everyone who decided to join us today. It's been a super insightful session, I think. Uh, and just before we say goodbye, I just want to remind the audience a couple of things. So first, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we still have other courses that open uh, at this point for enrollment. So we encourage everyone to check them out. We posted the link uh, in the chat earlier. Uh, and second one, that there will be another live event uh, for in this spring series, uh, probably in a few weeks. So stay tuned because we, we'll let you know soon. And again, thank you so much, Rafaela. Thank you so much, Paolo, uh, for joining us today. And just have a great week, everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, guys. Bye.